Well, good afternoon. I'm Bob Wilhelm, Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development here at UNL. And I want to thank you for joining us today for the 11th Nebraska lecture this year. This, this year we've had monthly Nebraska lectures in celebration of our 150th year uh, anniversary. And today's presentation is the final event of this week's research days. We've been having all sorts of different uh, events addressing research and uh, recognizing faculty and staff and our partners in terms of what they're doing. And also we brought in a number of different kinds of speakers. Uh, we even uh, were able to schedule our most demanding site visit for a, for a very large uh, project that we're competing for right now to be right in the middle of a research week. So we had some extra work this week. Um, this is this uh, celebration. We've, we've celebrated uh, research, scholarship, creative activities. And it's been really to, to, to use this particular Nebraska lecture series uh, to reflect on the accomplishments uh, of, of the 150 years. So the week that we've had, we've been reflecting on our accomplishments in the last year. But the, the series has really helped, uh, helped us to look back at 150 years of creative work, of research, and scholarship at the University of Nebraska. This lecture series is sponsored by the UNL Research Council in cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor, the Office of, the research, of research and Economic Development, that's me, uh, and also the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which we know as OLLI. And I want to make a special welcome to any, I'm sure there's some OLLI members here today, so really glad that you're here with us. We also want to recognize Humanities Nebraska and its executive director, Chris Summerich, for helping sponsor this year's lectures. And we've also had special uh, support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is, has offered more funding for this expanded lecture series uh, with a grant. And we've been able, with this support, we've been able to create podcasts of each of the presentations. And so these presentations are available for people who can't make it today, uh, but they'll also be something that we can preserve over time and people can look back and see what we were talking about uh, during our 150th year. I also want to recognize the, the, the uh, university's research council, which includes faculty from many different disciplines uh, at Nebraska. The, the, the council, really handles all of the, the heavy lifting in terms of figuring out the program for the Nebraska lectures. And so they, they solicit nominations of faculty and then they make assessments. They, they choose faculty based on major accomplishments, recent accomplishments, and also the lecturer's ability to explain his or her work. And so this selection is very competitive and it's the highest recognition that the council bestows on individual council, uh, faculty members. I want to especially welcome uh, everyone that's joining us via live web stream and through the Facebook Live uh, interface that we have here today. Uh, we're going to begin the program soon. I'll introduce the speaker. The, I'll introduce our performers today and speakers. Uh, and after today's lecture, Anne Marie May, professor of economics, will moderate a question and answer session with our performers. If you, it's, I'm sure you want to stay through all of the performance. If you stay a little bit longer, we're also going to have a prize drawing at the end. So there's a special prize. You got to stay to win, uh, but that'll come at the at the end after we're finished with the question and answer session. And then beyond the question and answers, we'll have a, a short reception. You can visit with the presenters uh, who I'm about to in introduce now. So so far, the the and the tonight. The, the 2019 Nebraska lectures have reflected on the university and the state from, from many different perspectives. We've heard about the history of campus architecture, the evolution of Husker school spirits, the role of the Nebraska's unicameral, and many others. This is the 11th one we've done so far. Uh, today's lecture will explore Nebraska's past and pre present from yet another vantage point, the composition and performance of music. Unlike many of our previous lectures, Greg Simon's connection to Nebraska just started a few years ago when he joined the Glencorf School of Music as an assistant professor of composition and jazz studies uh, in 2016. Originally from California, Greg is a jazz trumpeter and a composer whose career has taken him around the country, including Oregon, Colorado, Michigan, many other places. His music has been praised for its high energy, solo turns, 
and Upbeat Personality, and his work has been performed by groups around the country. Greg's music draws from a variety of inspirations, including jazz, funk, street art, and Chilean, Chilean uh, folk song, and its content focuses on heritage and intersection, aiming to create a common space between the communities that it reflects. The thematic focus, that thematic focus made Greg the perfect artist to compose Nebraska Songbook, the first composition that he created entirely in Nebraska. This piece will be performed by two more faculty from the School of Music, soprano Jamie Reimer and pianist Brenda Riston. Jamie, an associate professor of voice, has performed in opera, oratorio, and recital venues across the US, Italy, Germany, Brazil, Australia, around the world. She's also a researcher with a focus on contemporary American art song, particularly the life and work of Robert Owens, an African-American composer pianist and actor. His work has been published, her work has been published in the Journal of Singing and Pan Pipes, and she lectures frequently around the U.S. and abroad. Brenda Riston, professor of piano and piano pedagogy, is also an accomplished performer and researcher. Her recent performances include the premiere of Nebraska Songbook at the Nebraska Music Teacher Association State Conference, and as faculty guests guest soloist performance with U the UNL Symphony, Symphony Orchestra. Her research focuses on mus musician occupational health issues, including issues affecting music students at universities, the biomechanics of piano techniques, and the challenges faced by small-handed piano players. She's co-author of a groundbreaking book, Adaptive Strategies for Small-Handed Pianists, and is recipient of the Discoveries and Breakthroughs Through Inside Science Award from the Human Factors and Ergonomic Society and the American Institute of Physics. So please join me in welcoming Greg, Jamie, and Brenda. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to Dr. Wilhelm, and thank you to the, uh, um, the, the entire team behind the Nebraska Lecture Series. It's something very special, and it's a great honor to be on the stage uh, speaking with you. Um, the Nebraska Songbook is a project that has a long story behind it um, and represents a lot of things for me, namely community, creativity, and composing song, as you can see on the, on the first slide here. Um, before we jump in, I, I want to talk about a little bit of what we're going to talk about uh, for the next half hour. Um, what, what I'm going to share with you is what I see as, as the impetus for composing song and the importance of song in documenting um, story, heritage, community, things that motivate me as a researcher. And to that end, um, I want to begin by sharing with you, when I sit down, to write song. Um, I start by asking myself a couple of core questions. The first of which is, why am I actually doing this? What is the goal of composing art song? What value does it have as, as a method of reflecting or creating a community? Um, within that, every art song, by definition, is a setting of someone, someone's text, usually, not exclusively, someone else's text. So how can music enrich poetry? What is it that being a uh, composer of song actually brings to the poetry that the poetry is incapable of creating itself? And by the same token, how can poetry enrich music? Why is it that this particular form is of any value at all? Um, these are questions that we're going to answer over the course of the next half hour together or so. Um, but before, uh, before we get to that, I do need to tell you a little bit about where I come from and, and what my story is. Uh, yeah, that's, that's me. Um, my story begins in uh, Livermore, California in 1985 and continues on to Corvallis, Oregon, which was uh, for most of, my, uh, most of my adolescence, that was home for me. Um, once I graduated, I attended the University of Puget Sound at Tacoma, Washington, the University of Colorado at Boulder, and finally the University of Michigan. And when I arrived in Nebraska to uh, assume my job at the Glencore School of Music, I had never been to the state before. So it was a brand new experience to come to Nebraska. And I, as, as I think any, 
outsider coming to Nebraska um, would attest to, I had a variety of expectations about what this place was, who its people were, and what it meant to be a Nebraskan. And while some of those were in part true, many of them were false. Um, this is not necessarily a, a postcard. There are elements of it that, that, sh that definitely arise from our history of the, the Willa Cather image of Nebraska, but there is so much more to it. And around the time that the Nebraska Songbook Project started, I was starting to consider my own identity inside this place as a, as a new Nebraskan and, and what it really meant to me to be here and what it meant to be a creative artist here. And so the Nebraska Songbook was really an effort at the core to figure out the answer to some of those questions. Uh, this project was commissioned by the Nebraska Music Teachers Association and written during a residency at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know the center, uh, the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center for the Arts is in Nebraska City. It's one of the most beautiful places you'll ever see in your life. I highly recommend a visit even if you're not an artist. They've got a tremendous gallery. Some really innovative and creative thinkers are always there in residence and they give terrific artist talks. It's an incredible place to be creative. And between all of these factors, this was right at the beginning of my time in Nebraska. This was commissioned by a Nebraska entity. This was written as part of a residency in Nebraska. And in addition to that, it just so happened that this was the first project that I actually didn't bring with me from my previous stop in Ann Arbor, Michigan in any part. I began the process of sketching, conceiving the entire project right here in Lincoln, which meant that this was going to be my first Nebraska piece. And as such, the goal at the outset was to try to figure out what exactly does that mean for a creative artist? And what is the relationship between location and creation, especially for someone who is trying to reflect an identity to which they are an outsider? Uh, the creative community behind this piece is equally as important. While I was at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center, um, I stumbled upon this book, Nebraska Presence. Now, some of you may or may not recognize this book, but this is an anthology of poetry edited by the Backwaters Press out of Omaha um, by uh, Greg Kosmicki and uh, Mary Stilwell. And earlier on in the process, I had started reading a lot of poetry. I had decided at this point that what I really wanted to write was a setting of all Nebraska poets. And I started by looking back in history 150, 125 years. Uh, eventually, I got bored. And I decided to look more recent. And I stumbled upon this book, Nebraska Presence, which features exclusively recent, mostly living, but all contemporary Nebraskan poets. It is quite a resource. And as soon as I picked it up, I was inspired. I dog-eared somewhere between 18 and 20 different poems that are featured in this collection. It really is a tremendous resource for anyone who's interested in what is happening in contemporary poetry in Nebraska. That's where the story begins, but that's not where the story ends. Because as anyone who's ever composed for voice knows, that before, um, before you actually can write any music, you have to get permission to do so from the poet. And this is a process that quite infamously takes years sometimes and of, often ends with the word no. Um, and then you're back at the starting point. I got in touch with Greg Kosmicki, who is uh, one of the editors of Nebraska Presence. I explained to him my project. I said, hey, I am interested in writing a setting of some contemporary Nebraskan poets. Uh, can you get me in touch with them? And not only was he... Uh, extremely rapid in his response. I think I heard from him in about 20 minutes after that. But he immediately got me in touch with every single one of the poets that I asked him to, and by the end of the week, I had all the permissions that I needed to begin work on the Nebraska Songbook, which is frankly unconscionable for a composer. That was, to me, in many ways, an indicator that what this project stood for and, and what my goals for this project were had value in, in the eyes of the poets that I, that I was interested in working with. Um, and so suddenly, I felt the weight of, uh, of the project a little bit more. And it forced me to really start defining what exactly I wanted this project to do. Question one, what is the goal of composing art song? And here's what I came up with. 
for Nebraska Songbook. First and foremost, I wanted to celebrate the poets and their texts. I wanted to share and magnify those things that I found so striking and so resonant in every single one of those words, even as an outsider to Nebraska. I also wanted to illustrate that at the end of the day, all of these poets were co coexisting inside the same universe, the same state, the same ecosystem, the same community. And by the same token, I wanted to explore a Nebraskan identity. What does it mean to be Nebraskan? What does it mean to be an outsider who is now Nebraskan? What do these things mean? And of course, because I am a composer, I wanted to create a Nebraskan sound world, whatever that meant. And at the time, at the outset of this, as is often the case in the compositional process, I had no idea what the answer was. This was something that I was going to have to figure out. One of the other questions that's not listed up here is, what do all of these goals mean for choosing texts? As I mentioned, I had found between 18 and 20 that I, that I loved enough to set. Well, an 18 to 20 song song cycle is probably about seven hours worth of music. So I did have to try to triage, at least for this first volume. My ultimate hope is that the Nebraska Songbook is the first in a series of maybe three or even four different volumes of songs, and I can get around to all of those other texts that I love so dearly. But for now, I chose four. Marilyn Dorff's Dawnwatch, October by Shirley Buettner, The November Hawk by Stephen Barrent, and Recent Angels by Kim Tedrow. We will look extensively at what these four texts have to do with each other and what I saw as the common threads between them. But that's as good a starting point as any to answer the second question. How can the poetry enrich the music? That is, when you are looking at music, excuse me, when you are looking at poetry, how can the music fit inside it and magnify certain elements of its expressive energy? And of course, this begins with a lot of analysis. What you're looking at on the screen now is some of the analysis of the text that I did while I was at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center, uh, but it is not nearly all of the analysis that I did at the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center. This is just really, at the end of the day, an illustration of my process. And that process is itself an endeavor to answer these two questions. What is common to the texts? What do these texts have to do with each other? And by extension, because all of these artists are coming at the question of Nebraskan identity, what is common to the Nebraska experience? Uh, many of you probably noticed that as you came in, uh, you were able to uh, grab a one sheet with all of the text in front of you, so feel free to refer as we continue. Here's what I saw as, as the common areas within the text. Ephemerality. There, was, there is an essence in all of these texts of fleetingness. Of, of a sense that everything about the world that the poets is, are, are depicting can change and is changing. Of course, this being Nebraska, there's also a strong presence of the natural world. There's a tension between that what we see and what we do not see, especially in the context of that natural world. Stephen Barron's November Hawk does a particularly poignant job, I think, of, of, of doing this. And of course, all of these three things summed to me to what I think of as the core thematic energy behind this, uh, these texts, which is tension between the past and the future of Nebraska. Something I, I think I would share with you here is uh, Nebraska's three largest counties, Douglas, Lancaster, and Sarpy, all hit record population levels as of July 1st of last year and now account for more than 55% of the 1.93 million people in Nebraska. That's an all-time high. And at the same time, those counties, since 2010, they have added more than 107,000 people. And at the same time, the state has lost almost 4,500. The rest of the state, excuse me, the rest of the state has lost almost 4,500 people. So there is a definite shift happening in Nebraska. There is a definite change in what it means to be Nebraskan. There is a tension between rural and urban. There is a tension between past and future. This is something that I saw immediately in all of these texts. And it was the thing that I went into the Nebraska Songbook Project hoping to engage with and be in dialogue with. What comes next for me is the music. And I'll begin by sharing this quote from uh, Lennox Barclay, uh, who was a British composer who passed away about uh, 2008, but had a tremendous amount of vocal music. And he had this to say, 
One has only to think what a composer has to do to a poem. He has to destroy or at best modify its natural rhythm. He cannot possibly adhere to its actual meter. He then has to translate it into another medium. His only excuse for doing such a thing is that he feels he can recreate its atmosphere and feeling in the language of music. There is no way for a composer to be a poet. There is no way for a composer to mirror the energy, and there is no reason for a composer to mirror the energy of a poem. A composer's charge instead, as I see it, is to magnify the message of a poem, to highlight certain elements, to make the poem more powerful than it otherwise could be. And that, by definition, involves some distension of the meaning of the poem. That, by definition, involves making hard decisions about what the relationship between the text and the music are going to be, or is going to be, and how that relationship will evolve over the course of the song, the cycle, the work. Which, of course, leads to this question, the big question. How can the music enrich the poetry? That is, what justifies the distension of the poem into a musical form from its original non-sonic form? This process begins with a whole bunch of sketching. And when I say sketching, what I mean is getting a big blank sheet of music and writing notes on it, and writing notes on it with, with no home, no structure, no definitive left to right energy, but gathering musical ideas that the text brings to the forefront in the mind of the composer. This is step one, and once you have enough of these, then you can start engaging with the actual texts and figuring out how those ideas that you've created are going to fit inside of them. So we'll begin, we'll go chronologically to begin. Uh, Dawn Watch by Marilyn Dorff is, is a short, intensely beautiful poem uh, that essentially tells the story of an old fish coming to the surface of a relatively placid body of water for just a second. And for me, this was indicative of so, echoing of so many of the bigger themes that I wanted to touch on in this cycle. Ephemerality. It cannot stay at the surface forever. Tension between past and future. As you read through the poem, you start to get the sense of struggle. This is an old fish. This is a, this is a fish that is maybe not as able as it once was to get to the top of the, uh, to get to the surface of the water. And I wanted to paint this sense of, of growth and transformation and maybe even struggle. And that began with one of my favorite musical devices, which is pedal point. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know, pedal point is a musical device in which there is a single pitch that is held constant obliquely against a moving pitch and used to create certain levels of tension. Um, my, uh, my collaborator and colleague here, Brenda Riston, is going to help me with this part of the talk. And uh, we're going to have some musical examples. So Brenda, this is QA. Uh, this is the opening of Dawn Watch. The original idea was for this to continue for the entire cycle and have everything else evolve against it, constantly expanding around it until we finally get to the surface of the water. Within that, it's impossible to write, I think, vocal music without considering what is the relationship between the voice and the accompanying instrument. So there was always going to be this sense, and this is going to be a recurring theme here today, of dialogue between the soprano and the piano, where at least in this opening, what you're going to hear when you finally get a chance after I'm done rambling to listen to this song cycle, is you're going to hear this call and response, this back and forth between these melodic phrases in the piano and what happens in the voice. And I wanted, as we went further in the cycle, to see how this idea in particular was going to evolve. Which leads me to the second song, October by Shirley Buettner. Uh, this is a really incredible poem in its own right. Um, tells the story of really just paints a, a Nebraska day 
in, in October. And there are a lot of ways I think you can interpret musically what the content of that poem is. But what I saw within it was this emphasis on motion, this emphasis on vibrancy, uh, which struck me as odd since I had just finished a couple of Nebraska Octobers that were not that. Um, so I, I latched on to this idea that even when it's 20 degrees out and all the leaves are off the trees, or by contrast, when it's 87 degrees out and all the leaves are still on the trees, there's still this sense of motion, sense of moving between two places. There are other things that fascinated, about the, fascinated me about this poem, but we'll get there in due time. Uh, to begin, I needed to create a vibrant, mobile landscape. And my way of doing that was to find a piano ostinato that felt to me like it could be in constant motion. So what you're going to hear now, Brenda is going to play QB. This is the beginning of October. And once again, that is going to continue ad nauseum, and that is going to be married with long lyrical vocal lines, again exploring this relationship between voice and piano and how they fit within the context of each other. And that constant motion in the piano is, is going to continue for most of the song. However, you will notice, I think, if you read through the poem and if you sit with it for a couple minutes, that there are these moments where the narrator ceases to look outward, ceases to look at the October day and starts to look inward at themselves. And in those moments, the constant motion of the piano is going to stop. In those mo moments, the piano is going to suspend. And, and to me, that is an indication that our focus has turned from the vibrant outside to the inside that maybe has another adjective attached to it. November Hawk by Stephen Barrent is the longest poem in the set and one that tells a really um, throttling story about a hawk that is, is seen and then not seen and then seen again and explores lots of different themes within it. But the big ones that I derive from it are fear, mistrust, and guilt. And Perhaps out of all four of the songs in the set, this one most directly engages, I think, with the theme of what we see versus what we do not see. And so this was all going to be, for me, a study in dichotomy. This song was going to be all about one thing versus another thing, and then perhaps at the end of the cycle, discovering that the whole time we had misunderstood something and we had done so to the peril of another creature. So I began with developing what were the musical materials I was going to use that were going to indicate the hawk in this story. And there are several tools at a composer's disposal to do this, but I chose two. One is a motive, which is a small recurring melody meant to signify something. One is a collection, which is a collection of notes. You may consider it uh, to be a scale or a chord that in this case, Every time the music is derived from that collection, the hawk is in the air. Uh, Brenda's going to begin by playing QC, which is the uh, hawk motive. That's it. <laughs> but then outside of that, the hawk has a collection. Even when we're not, vi we're not aware of its presence, even when it's not visible, we can always feel it. The hawk is always around, even when it's not visible. And that hawk collection consists of these notes. Anytime you hear harmonic material derived from those eight notes, you know the hawk is in the room. If the hawk has music, we must also have music. Uh, QE, this is the collection that represents humanity and its presence in the song. Mm -hmm. 
every note in November Hawk is derived from one of those two collections. And the whole song is really the story of evolving dominance. We begin with music that is dominated by the Hawk's presence, that even, even the humans, when they are sitting at Thanksgiving with company around the table, they cannot concentrate on each other because they are thinking about that hawk. And as the cycle evolves and evolves and evolves, we finally learn that not only was the hawk never a threat at all, but it was our ignorance, our fear, that stopped us from attending to another creature in its, its time of need. So we begin then with hawk-driven music, the hawk mode of the hawk collection, and we slowly get overtaken by music that is taken from the human collection. And this brings me to Kim Tedrow's Recent Angels. Recent Angels was written in memory of a woman named Tina Garachi, who died very tragically. And when I spoke to Kim directly about this song, she mentioned that among the inspirations for it was uh, Miss Garachi left behind a small child. And it, she imagined the child looking for his mom and, and not being able to find her. And for me, this was so interesting because it is, it is a song that, or is it, it is a text rather, that doesn't have any, what you might call in scare quotes, Nebraska signifiers. There's no wide open prairie, there's no sandhill cranes. There's very little acknowledgement, literally, of, of the natural world that defines so much of the Nebraska experience. But in the same, at the same time, it is thematically, literarily occupying all of the same spaces that all three of these other texts are. Ephemerality, tension between the seen and the unseen, tension between the past and future. And when I thought about this text, and, and I'm, a, I'm a very visual person, I, I can't draw to save my life, but I'm a very visual person. When I thought about the vision of this text, the image that it, came, that it conjured for me, um, this image that you see here of the uh, Omaha skyline was the first thing that came to me, was a different side of Nebraska that is not as removed from the rest of Nebraska as, as we tend to think. And so I just wanted to paint the text. That was my ultimate goal here. This was a way to bring all of these forces that have been explored in the rest of the text into community with one another. And the easiest tool that I had to do that at the beginning was recitative, just a simple, timeless song between the soprano and the piano that allowed me to just write what I thought of, of a really beautiful melody. And then the text entered the equation and began to shape my thinking about it. And what I finally came up with were constantly ascending lines. This is a song about angels, after all. And so QF is, is an example of some of the lines that we're going to hear in recent angels. Even with everything intersecting and overlapping, you can tell that there's always a sense of ascension in the piano part. And when I started thinking more about the text and when I started thinking more about the relationship between the soprano and the piano, what I finally decided was that even though the piano is in constant ascension, the soprano is not. There is a divide in Recent Angels between what we can see and what we cannot see. And that manifests in the musical material of the singer versus the musical material of the piano. This was the beginning, was figuring out the story that I wanted to tell individually with each one of these songs. But in addition, as I said, one of the primary goals that I had for the Nebraska Songbook was to create a world that acknowledged that all of these songs, all of these texts were interconnected. They all inhabited the same space, both literally, geographically, and emotionally. And so I set out at the beginning of the writing process, in addition, to find ways that I could connect 
these songs together musically, to find ways in which the music could bring out the common themes of the text. And I came up with two primary strategies for doing so. One was to literally connect the songs using what I call pitch seams uh, and the uh, constituent harmonic areas of each song. And the other was using that concept that we discussed earlier, motivic material, to connect each one of the songs. I'll begin with talking about pitch seams. Now what you see up here is a very poorly drawn graph that demonstrates just some of the major key areas of each one of these four songs, Dawn Watch, October, The November Hawk, and Recent Angels. And we don't need to make too much discussion out of this, but only to point out that the final note of each song creates a bridge to the beginning of the next. There was this sense, I wanted there to ultimately be the sense that as we finish one song, we were not smash cutting to a different part of Nebraska. We were not moving wholesale from one scene to another, but rather that these were points on a gradient, rather that these were part of a common tapestry. And one of the ways to do that was to make sure that to the best of my abilities as a composer, we were always picking up where we left off with the previous song. I also wanted to explore a motivic connection. I wanted to come up with some material that I thought indicated that, that I thought indicated all of these varying thematic ideas that, that we've been discussing. And what I came up with was this very small theme that I just colloquially call the Nebraska motive, and this is QG. That motive is present ubiquitously in every single song that you're about to hear. Um, and it became the focal point of the compositional process. Now, motivic composition is nothing new. This is something that uh, composers have been doing since people were writing music. Uh, what I wanted to explore is, in my own way, not only just using motives, but in my own way, what were all the ways that I could hide this motive, that I could put it places that we would feel its presence but not be actively aware of its presence. And was there a gradient in that? Were there times that it could be prominent and times that it could be less so? So that led me to an exploration of all the different ways that I could play with the Nebraska motive, all the different ways that I could distend and distort this motive. One of the easiest ones is repetition, and rhythmic and intervallic variations. So we have this little excerpt from October, and this is QH. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, this motive, um, this melody comes from the Nebraska motive unequivocally, right? We can see the connections. We can also see that the, rhythm, the rhythmic context, content has changed. We're using different note values. We're augmenting, that is, lengthening certain areas, and we are shortening or diminishing certain areas. But more importantly, we're also, as we go, making other changes to the motive. So in this particular case, you'll notice that the second iteration of this motive has just widened the central interval. And in doing so, taken that fragment and made it feel just a little bit different. It's still very much the Nebraska motive, but it's a little bit different. There are other tools that we have to do this as well. Fragmentation is a composer's best friend. And this is simply the process of breaking down a motive to its constituent parts and exploring in their own motific ways some of these constituent parts. So this is QI. So you may have heard something that sounded like the Nebraska motive in, in that landscape, and you may not have. What's important is how they're conceived. Now I've highlighted two small fragments 
of the Nebraska motive on the screen. A simple downward step and a simple three note contour pattern. And what you'll notice if you look closely is that every single note of this melody is some sort of transformation of one of those two fragments. So this is using the Nebraska motive in a hidden way to build a brand new melodic line. There are other ways we can do this as well. One of them is to start with the Nebraska motive or to start with the motive generally and remove notes from it to create a new motive. Uh, this is from Recent Angels. This is QJ. Again, you may find some shades in the Nebraska motive of this or not, but if you look at the notes present in the Nebraska motive, what you may notice is that they are pulled from some of the notes in the Nebraska motive but not all of them. What I've done here is I've taken away just a couple of notes to create a new motivic entity, to create a new melody that has its roots in the Nebraska motive, but is not itself the Nebraska motive. Now a slightly more sophisticated, complex way of doing this is through contrapuntal presentation of a motive like this from Don Watch, QK. So the composition of this particular line begins by representing every single one of the notes of the Nebraska motive. We can see them there. Uh, you can see the top line is coded in blue. And what you'll notice is now they're happening on top of each other. They're overlapped with one another. So this is again a way of fashioning two different motivic presentations or melodic presentations from the same motive. And the, the Nebraska motive is of course always present in these sorts of textures. And finally, when all else fails, transform all the intervals. Uh, this is QL. That doesn't bear too much sonic similarity to the simple plaintive Nebraska motive until you dig a little deeper and you see that every single one of these is an interval from the Nebraska motive that has been somehow distorted. You can see that at the beginning I've added to that initial step, I've added an octave. Later on I've just wholesale swapped interval types, so the third and the second which were formerly a second, then a third, have been swapped. I've augmented intervals, which means I've added inver uh, intervallic space to them. I've inverted them, which means I've turned them upside down. And because I am a jazz musician, I've used a good old fashioned tritone sub at the end and treated a tritone equivalently to a unison. Now this is getting very jargony, but really the point of it is that every time we hear something like this, we may or may not be sonically aware of the Nebraska motive, but my hope as a composer is that we are unconsciously aware of its presence. My hope as a composer is that if I can put enough forethought into my compositional choices, even when those compositional choices are buried below the surface, then the echoes of those make their way to a listener. And without necessarily having to hold that listener's hands through the connections that I see in all four of these texts and that I see in the music, my hope is that if I'm doing my job correctly, they can feel them. And they can find all of these things, that sense of community and togetherness, even in dark times, that motivated me to write the song cycle in the first place. Now, before I turn it over to my colleagues for a performance of this, um, I do need to acknowledge just a couple of people who, without whom this would not have been possible. Uh, many of them you've already met, the Nebraska Music Teachers Association, the Kimmel Harding Nelson Center, my colleagues Jamie and Brenda, Greg Kosmicki at the Backwaters Press, Teresa Ingram, who handled uh, permissions for um, Shirley Butner, who had unfortunately passed away before I got a chance to ask her myself, the Glencorf School of Music, my home away from home. And of course, this does not happen without the 
overwhelming support of every single one of the poets that was gracious enough to give me their creation and, and trust, trust in my ability to, to make it into something new. Um, that is no small gift for an artist. So as long as I have this particular podium and this particular microphone, I'm going to take a moment to say thank you all so much. It means the absolute world to me to be able to undertake this project. Finally, if you are one of those people who likes to see the score, all you got to do is snap that key UR code. And with that, I will turn it over to my performance colleagues. Thank you so much for your time. This is Nebraska Songbook.
For weeks he hung around, lurking at the fence, three feet from the feeders. Young hawk, hunching without threat, wild cardinals and finches prodded tubular feeders. Sifting millet from Niger seed, thistle. Day after day, it appeared. Watching them with big sharp eyes, head cocking left, right, left, right. At Thanksgiving, with company, but we watched and wondered. At a young red tail haunting the feeders, silent, curious, then for days. No hawk, nor sign of his. No vanilla cream breast feathers ruffling in the wind. As the last pods rattle from the locusts, the squirrels hurry from Fields, the last green cause of fear. 
If you see her, you will know her. You will know her by the way she glances sideways as you pass. Keeps you at the end.
Thank you so much for sharing your talents with us. We greatly appreciate it. And um, we would like to open it up for some questions and answers. And um, if you could, we have volunteers who will bring you a microphone. Be sure and wait to get the microphone so that our friends on Facebook and who are live streaming this can hear your questions as well. So with that, if you have any questions, just Raise your hand, let us see you, and our performers and um, composer would be happy to answer your questions. Your collaboration was beautiful, and I'm curious from each of your perspectives, what is the most challenging aspect of this piece? So Greg says he yields the floor to us. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. <laughs> um, I was really fortunate in the beginning of this collaboration, Greg and I sat down for, gosh, two or three hours, I think. Um, and he asked me some very insightful questions about what it meant to be a singer, what kinds of things I liked to sing, what other composers I was fond of. And so I, I feel very privileged because I feel like Greg wrote some of this, whether he intentionally did it or not. Um, after some of the thoughts that we shared, um, because these sorts, this piece, while very rhythmically challenging, um, the long, long lines are some of my favorite things to sing, so I really enjoyed that. Um, and it was very much a gift to me to have Brenda at the piano because she is so pristinely precise rhythmically. So it was great to know that she was there doing these very complex things that Greg had asked for in this musical soundscape, but knowing that she was a solid rock and wasn't ever going to waver, that made what I had to do easier. The question was, what was most challenging or what? what was most I've forgotten the question. What was the most challenging? What was the most challenging? Um, I also had an opportunity to sit down with Greg before uh, he composed the piece, which I really welcomed. And he asked me, what were some of my favorite things to play? Um, and my response to that was Debussy. Um, I love Debussy textures. And so he wrote many of those into October, um, which I have really enjoyed playing. 
In terms of just the challenge, I think, yeah, the rhythmic elements of the piece, um, the, the way the piece lies between the singer and the piano has its moments, for sure. But that's our job to figure that out. <laughs> um, well, I, I had the opportunity to sit down with both of them before I started writing, um, which is, is something that I, I think is, given the opportunity, indispensable for a composer, um, especially if you're going to collaborate. Um, as Jamie knows very, very well, no human voice is the same as any other human voice. And so when you're, when you're writing for a singer, you are writing for a singer. Um, the challenge, I suppose, is in shaping my expressive intentions in such a way that I know will maximize not only the capabilities of both the singers, but, um, but, but do so in a way that is going to make them love the piece so much that they want to perform it. Um, because I, I think I can confidently say that all three of us have been involved in new music projects that we absolutely couldn't stand. And um, that, that really does, it, it, we're, we're all professionals, we'll do it. Um, but it is, it is so much nicer to, to do something you believe in. And, and part of that, I think, is, is not only conceiving of what, what your, your favorite music to play and what your technical limitations are, but, but also who these musicians are as people. And especially in the context of a practice uh, project like this, uh, learning from them what it means to be Nebraskan and, and what it means in, in the case of Brenda, who, like me, comes from elsewhere, uh, what it means to be an outsider who adopts a place as home. Um, those sorts of, of conversations take time and they take energy, and and occasionally we do, and and I think Brenda and I certainly did come at loggerheads over uh, part of November Hawk at some point. Well, I say okay, fair enough. All right. So so yeah, we, we we didn't get in a fist fight or anything like that, but um, but but there was some disagreement, and there and there was some there there were some things that we had to hash out. Um, ultimately, it's it's hard to describe it as a challenge because I do think the piece is better for it, and it was something that I, I was ready for and was happy to kind of take on, like, yeah, br bring bring those sorts of comments on. Um, but but it is a conversation that has to happen. Does that answer your question? Hi. My favorite was November Hawk, and I was just curious, did the authors of the poem give you free reign in composing their piece? Um, the, the world of seeking poetic permissions is such that the more I can ask for what I need to legally set the piece, and no more than that, the better. Um, I regretfully was not as collaborative with the poets ultimately as I, as I would have liked to be. Part of that was because I was on sort of a timeline. I wanted to get it done while I was in residency at the Gilmore Harding Nelson Center. Um, but to more directly answer your question, uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. I, I, um, I felt a lot of confidence from the poets in, in what I was doing. And, and I, was, I was ultimately able to share with some of them, um, for, for some of them, this may actually be, if they're tuning in, uh, the first time that they've heard some of them. And did they hear before us the, the composition? No, in fact. So, so this, th this may be a fun surprise to some of them. Um, and, and part of that was because, because this was uh, commissioned by NMTA, the premiere was legally designated to take place at the conference, which was only open to conference attendees. Um, and and there's, there's nothing more painful than a MIDI realization of a new piece of music. So I opted not to share that with the poets. I opted to keep that separate. Um, but I think, I think that when I, when I approached them, I'd like to think that, that I, I presented myself as very genuine and, and caring very deeply about wanting to do their work justice. And, and especially with, uh, with the case of um, 
Kim Tedrow, who was very, very open about, about the inspiration for Recent Angels and, and the story that, that inspired the writing of it, um, I always felt a great deal of confidence from them in what I was doing, um, which is absolutely the sweet spot for a composer is, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm sure it's gonna be great. There's no better feeling in the world than to hear that. Uh, for Greg, as someone who admitted that you were not from Nebraska and hasn't been here for, for quite a long time, were there people that you talked to when you were selecting these verses to, to get a representation, or did you just pick verses that sort of represented the Nebraska that you felt? That's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, a, a, as I said, there are maybe, maybe 12 to 14 different poems that I haven't gotten around to yet. Um, and one of the really special things about Nebraska Presence is that it is a wild cross-section of, of different people and, and coming from, from all over Nebraska. There, there are poets ranging from um, Shirley Butenur, who uh, passed away a couple of years ago, all the way to uh, one of the poets in the anthology was the ripe old age of 22 uh, when she was published in it. Um, they come from Omaha, they come from Shadron, they come from North Platte, they come from Grand Island, they come from right here in Lincoln, a lot of them. Um, it is beyond me, I think, as a composer to represent universally what it means to be Nebraskan. Um, any more than it is possible for me to represent what it is to universally be a human being. Um, every, every human being has a different experience, and every Nebraskan has a different experience. I think my, my goal at the outset was to keep my ears open to people I trusted, artists I trusted, and, and, and try to tell their story best I could. Within that, I also have, this being UNL, I have a lot of students who are from Nebraska, and I did ab absolutely have a lot of conversations with them about what they thought it meant. And, and about what, you know, especially because many of them are artists in training who want to go on to larger uh, professional scenes, you know, want to make the dive to uh, New York, Chicago, LA, things like that. Um, we had a lot of conversations about identity and community and what they felt was in Nebraska, what Nebraska meant to them and what was worth preserving about it. Um, so, so the answer is no, but also yes, I suppose. Thanks. Good work, you guys. So this is a question for, for Jamie, because I know that she sings art song a bit. What exactly is the definition of art song, and why is, why is this one an art song? Because that's a, that's a genre, I, I take it. And who are some of the leaders in art song? So I would invite all of you to enroll in art song one which is offered every other fall at the Glencore School of Music, if you would like to know more about the topic. Um, but to briefly um, answer Dean O'Connor's question, art song I like to think about is a photograph of a moment, as opposed to an aria, which is a lar often a larger work that lives in the context of a larger story, like an opera, or a favorite tune from a musical that lives in the context of a larger story. An art song is a snapshot. And it's a, um, often a poem, but not always. It can sometimes be prose that is set to music in typically a small form, um, like this song cycle, which is what we call a group of songs when they are programmed together by intention of the composer. Sometimes you can have one, three, eight, 20, grouped, designed to be performed all at the same time. Um, but Greg gave us four individual beautiful portraits to perform today. And I think each of them provide a snapshot of part of the Nebraska experience. Art song, um, particularly in the United States, is alive and well. I'm thrilled to say that. Um, some of the more familiar pieces that people might recognize, composers, would be things like Schubert, and Debussy wrote um, several melody, which is what we call French art song. So art song, as, as we know it right now, really began in 1814 um, with Schubert's 
most famous Gretchen at the Spinning Wheel. But in the United States today, Art Song is alive and well, being set by really extraordinary composers of every ilk, um, every race, nationality, gender, persuasion that you can imagine. Um, it's a beautiful vehicle for composers to be able to share their thoughts and their reflections on the world. And quite often those composers are setting texts that are written like Greg by living poets, um, which makes for some really exciting collaborations. And I feel so privileged being able to create these little snapshots for audiences as, as part of my creative work. And, and so thank you for going through the photo album with us today. Okay, well, thank you again so very much for sharing your talents, and thank you all for um, joining us this Friday afternoon. Well, that was an incredible experience, and we have just a little something to, to uh, commemorate. We make posters for these events, and... Um, can I help you? Yeah, maybe you can help me with that. Okay. What do you need here? There you go. Maybe take those away. Take yeah. these away? Okay. Yeah. I have the answer too. There you go. There we go. I have three of them. Awesome. One for each. And I hope this uh, helps you remember this performance and this presentation. It was, again, wonderful. And I know that uh, everybody really enjoyed being here with you. And it's a, uh, a special uh, event for us to have as a Nebraska lecture here in the 150th year. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.